Hello, everybody. Um, yes, perfect. Okay. Welcome to this amazing event on a very amazing individual, Bell Hooks. Today, we have with us Mona Eltawe. Mona Eltawe is an award winning columnist and international public speaker on Arab and Muslim and global feminism. She is author of Headscarfs and Hymens Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. Her commentaries have appeared in several publications, and she is a regular guest analyst on various television radio shows. Give a round of applause to Mona Eltawe. Woo! We also have Malika Booker, who is a poetry lecturer at Manchester University, a British poet of Guyanese and Grenadian parentage, and the founder of Malika's Poetry Kitchen. Her first poetry collection, Pepper Seed, was shortlisted for the OCM Bocas Award and the Seamus Heaney 2014 Prize for First Full Collection. She is published with the poets Sharon Olds and Wu Sanshir in the Penguin Modern Poet series. She's also a Cave Caven Fellow. She won the Forward Poetry Prize for Best Single Poem in 2020. Give a round of applause. Thank you. And last, but definitely not least, we have Dr. Sana Asan, who is an award-winning poet, clinical psychologist, presenter, and educator. Her work is centered on compassion, troubling our colonial understandings of mental health, and embracing each other's madness. I love that. <laughs> Her psychological practice is rooted in liberation and community psychology, drawing on therapeutics, poetics, and post-activism as interconnected practices <coughs> to support radicalized and marginalized people. Okay. So, Bell Hooks. I'm uh, going to give her a round of applause. Yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry, 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 of course. Thank of course. you. <laughs> so, um, we were discussing earlier sort of how challenging it is to discuss Bell Hooks because of how expansive, brilliant, complex, and fantastic she is. So, we're going to do our best. Um, as an individual, Bell Hooks has influenced us all hugely. Uh, so, we're going to speak to that in the most concise possible version, <laughs> if ever possible. Um, so I'm going to read a small section that sort of, I guess, very briefly describes a small part of her legacy, and then we'll go into exactly how brilliant she truly is. So, Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks was an academic, a radical feminist, a poet, an author, a philosopher, and I always say philosopher because she doesn't get called a philosopher enough, and I think it's very important that we acknowledge that she was just as a philosopher as she was many other things, but a philosopher who flipped notions of love, feminism, capitalism, masculinity, and creativity upside down, recreating them with refined clarity and depth. She would apply this formula to all that she spoke and wrote about, doing so with infectious wit and intentionality. She chose not to capitalize the spelling of her name because she wanted people to focus on the substance of her work as opposed to her personal identity. It was also a means to pay respect and distinguish her from her grandmother, also named Bell Hooks. One of my personal early interactions with Bell Hooks was when I started a music blog very long ago, documenting hip hop, lyricism, and the genre's relationship to black women. And Hooks' sophistication in understanding human emotion, need, and love, specifically as it pertained to black women, was unlike anything I had ever come across. In many facets of my own work, her magical language influenced me and these amazing women on stage. I think much of Hooks' genius lay in her ability to unpeel and interrogate complex notions of the human condition, showing us that we could look at them in a more daring and often freeing way. She did this in a contemporary and accessible manner, appealing to the masses in a way that made many people feel seen. It is because of this wide-ranging accessibility, and when we scope out the development of things like digital feminism on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, much of it can be traced back to her brilliant work. Much of her teaching, importantly, was rooted in healing, vulnerability, and community. She encouraged us to say yes to the self. She spoke openly about how cultures of domination have taught us to think of power as outside of ourselves, urging us to shift our perspective and look at the power within. <coughs> she articulated gentle nuances of things we often communicate, like love and care, fantasy, pain, and for many of us who interacted with her writing, she pushed us to speak the truth with tenderness, pain, and power, even if it made us feel uncomfortable. Hooks more often was known for her assessment of the livelihood of black women, forcing the expansionist of feminist movements beyond her. She once said, I want my work to be about healing, and it was. Today, when we speak about things like joy, self-care, self-love, we must remember how Bell Hooks played a huge role in teaching a generation 
to center these ideals as radical praxis. Her legacy was of love, of self and of others. Her writing, lectures, interviews are waiting for us to sink into them. So today, we're going to discuss a little bit about that. So, um, Mona, mm. we're going to start with you. Okay. I would love you, obviously, to read an extract of your choice and then go into, I guess, her brilliance and how she influenced you and your work, and then we'll go into the other ladies. So there are so many entry points into Bell Hooks and what she represents for me. But I mentioned that I'm Egyptian and I'm also a New Yorker because the extracts that I'm going to read for you were extracts that I discovered from her various works when I was living in Cairo. I moved back to Cairo after the revolution began. So our revolution in Egypt was in 2011. And I moved back a year and a half later. And I think it was at end of 2013, 2014, when I began reading one of her books remembered Rapture, the writer at work. And I also um, attended a panel that she held with, um, I forget now who the other panelists were because I'm so jet lagged, but it was called Whose Booty Is This? And it was about transgression, and it was about sex, and it was about desire, and it was about all the things that those of you who've read and you should read this interview that she had with Lil' Kim mm -hmm. in the 1990s about you know, who owns our desire and who owns this booty, and who owns our pleasure and our access to pleasure. So I'm reading to you today from an essay called Class and the Politics of Writing, from a book called Remember Drapture, The Writer at Work. Many of us live with the fear that if we write about certain experiences, individuals we have written about, particularly family members, will punish that writing through ostracization. When I was a student in writing classes and at writing workshops, I never really heard anyone from a privileged class background talk about self-censorship that emerges from fear that writing certain experiences will lead family and friends to break ties. In some cases, writers from privileged classes were much more likely to hold a vision of writerly integrity that implied for them that there should be no discussion of the ethics of revealing aspects of another person's life who was not given their consent. From the moment I began to talk about the lives of members of my family, including their stories in my work, I began to think about the ethics of such writing. While punishing me, my parents often spoke about the necessity of breaking my spirit. Now when I ponder the silences, the voices that are not heard, the voices of those wounded and or oppressed individuals who do not speak or write, I contemplate the acts of persecution, torture, the terrorism that breaks spirits, that make, makes creativity impossible. I write these words to bear witness. Before many of us even confront, confronted the issues on confe of confessional writing, we had to grapple with the more basic question of claiming writing as a site for the articulation of our realities, especially nonfiction writing. Acknowledging this struggle in her work, The Last Generation, Cherry Moraga declares, and this now is one of my favorite ever quotes. Fundamentally, I started writing to save my life. Mm. Yes, my own life first. I see the same impulse in my students, the dark, the queer, the mixed blood, the violated, turning to the written page with a relentless passion, a drive to avenge their own silence, invisibility and erasure as living innately expressive human beings, end quote. And I love that this is bell hooks now, quoting Cherry Moraga, two heroes of mine. Again, the new ground that we were breaking at the onset of contemporary feminist movement concerns writing that is explicitly autobiographical and confessional. Moraga contends, a writer will write with or without a movement, but at the same time, for Chicano, lesbian, gay, and feminist writers, anybody writing against the grain of Anglo-misogynist culture, political movements are what have allowed our writing to surface from the secret places in our notebooks into the public sphere, end quote. After struggling to come to voice, we then confront ethical issues. And then I jump a bit to the next, uh, a few paragraphs later, and Bell Hooks continues. I was not eager to talk about my life precisely because I had been raised in a working class, southern black Christian home where talking openly outside the family about any aspect of family life was considered a form of treason. 
Similarly, describing her experience in a poor white southern household, Dorothy Allison shares, I'd been taught never to tell anyone outside my family what was going on, not just because it was so shameful, but because it was physically dangerous for me to do so. I didn't start writing, or rather I didn't start keeping my writing until 1974 when I published a poem. Everything I wrote before then, 10 years of journals and short stories and poems, I burned because I was afraid somebody would read them, end quote. Bell Hooks continues. Some of us feared violent responses from family members. This was true of Asian and Chicano women writers I knew as well. While many of us wrote of the power and passion of coming to voice, it was rare that anyone shared publicly the response to their work on the part of intimate family and friends. My writing was an act of resistance, not simply in relation to outer structures of domination like race, sex, and class. I was writing to resist all the socialization I had received in a religious southern working class patriarchal home that tried to teach me silence as the most desirable trait of womanliness." End quote. I chose those paragraphs because I identify inherently, implicitly, so powerfully with what Bell Hooks has written and because so many, especially young feminists and young queer people, come to my events and ask me, how do I write about my personal life? How do I write? I was workshopping with a group of students in the US just a few weeks before I came out here, and I was doing a workshop with them on memoir writing, and every single black and student of color asked me the same question. How do I write about my life without my family disowning me, without hurting my family, without placing myself in the kind of dangers that Cherry Moraga and Bell Hooks talk about? And identify, again, I identify with this personally because increasingly my writing recently, especially after the pandemic began, has become much more confessional, as Bell Hooks talks about, has become much more personal because in, in the essay where she talks about women who write too much, because Bell Hooks, believe it or not, was accused of writing too much. And she said black women could never write too much. And as a woman of color, I recognize that black women must own that space much more than I do because of the amount of, 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 because of the intersections of the various oppressions that they face. But as a woman of color from the backgrounds that I come from, I would like to take some of that space and say that I recognize that. And you can't, there's, there's never an instance where I can see a black or a woman of color writing too much. And Bell Hooks, in that essay, Women Who Write Too Much, quotes another author called Annie Dillard, who said, write as if you were dying. Mm -hmm. And I've really taken that to heart since the pandemic began because so many people died. My beloved's father died very early on in the pandemic. Five members of my extended family have died in the past year alone. And I like to say that in 2011, in November of 2011, when the Egyptian regime during a very iconic protest in our revolution in Egypt, in November, not, not during the 18 days of what we call the revolution, but in November of 2011, <coughs> Egyptian riot police broke both my arms and sexually assaulted me and I was interrogated and blindfolded and, and held incommunicado for 12 hours. And the way that I look at what happened to me then is I think of the Mona that I used to be dying. She died that night when she was assaulted. And she died in order to give me life. And she gave me life and said, speak the silences that I have not been able to speak. And I honor that Mona and I thank her for taking me to that moment. And I've, I've taken her on, I've, t I've, I've accepted the dare that she gave to me when she bequeathed me the silences. And I've spent the past decade doing what I call, what I called a recent essay that I contributed to an, an anthology called This Arab is Queer. And I called this anthology the decade of writing what I have not been able to say. And, and I, I, I relate that story of Mona dying so that this Mona could live. And I talk about all the silences that Bell Hooks has encouraged me and inspired me to break because I've been writing not only as if I were dying, but because I died, because I metaphorically died. And so what I've done since the pandemic began is I've, I've taken the risks that Cherry Moraga has said. I've avenged my silences. And I've looked at my silences in the eye and said, I am going to avenge me against you. And so I've written about my abortions something I never wrote about publicly until last year. And I've written about having an illegal abortion in Egypt in 1996, which I survived because I had the money to have a safe, albeit illegal abortion. 
And I've written about my legal abortion in the US in 2000, which very soon in many places in the United States, because of the fascist fuckery that is happening in the United States now in this theocracy, thanks to the Supreme Court, was going to be illegal in many places. And I didn't stop at my abortions because I took on the challenge that Bell Hooks and Cherry Moraga threw to me and Annie Dillard. Bell, Bell Hooks says, write as if death hovers and death does hover. And my feminist struggle in accepting Mona's challenge, the Mona who died, to the Mona who lives, is as a feminist, my goal in life is to be free. And so in avenging my silences, in the name of liberation, I have looked shame in the eye and I have said I will avenge my silences. So after writing about my abortion, I talk about this earlier in, in, in the feminist panel I spoke at earlier about what, what fuels my feminist fire. I thought, okay, what now? You know, what other silences can I avenge? And so I wrote this essay about being queer. And, and, I, and this is something that I barely told anyone. I wrote an essay about being bisexual, which I never uttered outside of this essay. I wrote about, I wrote about being queer, mostly bisexual, but I prefer the term queer, but I also wrote about being polyamorous because I reject monogamy because this is all in aid of being free. This is in aid of liberation. And what I appreciate about Bell Hooks also is that she, she wrote about being polyamorous and she wrote about how the sexual revolution in the way that the West, the so-called West, has defined it so far, has only benefited men because it's been a sexual revolution that has been very patriarchal. So the way that I take on that patriarchy and that misogyny is to avenge my silence, is to talk about being polyamorous, to talk about being queer, to talk about desiring women and men and gender expansive people, to talk about my abortions, to look all the silences that I have had to live with in the eye and in the name of Mona who died, liberating myself and avenging those silences and telling Mona who died, I have done it. I have smashed the silences that you gave to me and I am continuing to smash them because I consider courage like muscles that you need to exercise. You need to continue to challenge those muscles by lifting heavier and heavier weights. So now the challenge to myself is what now? What other silences and what other shame can I smash thanks to the work and the inspiration and the fire that Bell Hooks and Cherry Moraga gave me? Amazing. Wow. Wow, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. And testament again to Bell Hooks's, I love the fact that you refer to courage as a muscle. And it reminds me of one talk that Bell Hooks did when she referred to with each book that she published, she felt more and more vulnerable and more and more in pain and how challenging it was. And it got to the point, I think when she was on book 25, because this is a woman who wrote like 30 plus books, she suddenly had the most self doubt she ever did than when she wrote her first book. And she spoke about having to push past that with courage. <coughs> and all the thoughts from her childhood of people saying, who the fuck do you think you are? That was mm -hmm. her thing. Was, who the fuck do you think you are? She said, I heard that so much growing up. And suddenly, when I was on book 25, I felt it. And I had to push through courage. So I love the fact that unknowingly, when you refer to courage as a muscle, she's, that's existence of her life. So I think that was amazing. And I'm in awe at that. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. That Mike. was phenomenal. Thank you. Whew. Wow. wow, see the power of Bell Hooks, you see what she does, this is unbelievable. Wow. Um, Malika. I'm actually um, very moved mm. and um, I just want to um, honour the space that you've created mm. and I cannot speak yet without just staying in that space for a second. That was, that was so revolutionary and so wonderful to hear as a woman and so affirming. Um, so I just want to stay in that, just stay in that space and honour you, and honour your glasses. And yours too, hello. <laughs> game recognises game, thank you. Listen, um, so um, when, when I heard Bell Hooks died, the world changed. I think f from I heard the name Bell Hooks, I've never not known a Bell Hooks in this world. So, um, I didn't understand how we're gonna live in a world where there's, there's not a bell hooks. Um, so when, the panel, when I was called to do this panel, I said yes, I'd love to do this panel. And then as it went on, I thought, what do I know about bell hooks? I know absolutely nothing. Um, 
But I want to talk about a few things. Um, one, I want to talk about the fact that I grew up um, in Guyana in a, in a completely black country uh, with black teachers everywhere around me until the age of 11 was totally represented by myself, um, was totally represented by an education where everybody wanted me to do good and everyone gunned for me, um, where the teachers knew my mother and were told, we, I give you permission to do whatever you need to do to have her be the best that she could be. Um, and then I came over to England at 11 to a majority white school. Um, and from the first time that I went into that school, it was a struggle. Um, in the Caribbean, if you are, um, if you are a, a bright child and you do really well, you skip a year, you, you move up in the education chain. So I came over and they were, the first thing they did was said, oh, you've just come from the Caribbean, you're gonna go into D, which is the lowest stream of school, and you're also going to go back a year. Um, and my, my mother um, lived in America that time, um, and my mother and father educated um, and my aunt did not, go, did not go to university or did not go to, to, to further education. So my mother urged my, my aunt and my cousins to fight that. And so there was this cross-Atlantic fighting, um, which meant that I end up starting um, um, Sacred Heart Secondary School in Camberwell in, year two, in the second form. And I ended up starting at, in, the, in the C grade, in the higher grade. Um, what does that mean? I think that educational experience has shaped me for life. Um, and so when I decided to become a writer and I decided that I wanted to learn to write, I also started encountering those same things in the classroom, in the workshops, where, the, where I was the only black face in that workshop, where I would be told things by fellow people in that workshop. They would say to me, I thought you just made up your stuff. I thought you just made up your rapping. I thought you just rapped and made up things. What are you doing here? Why are you in that workshop? And so my workshops became, some of my workshops became a space where I was writing to show that to, to I was writing, instead of workshopping poems in draft, I was writing really poems that were excellent, trying to be excellent in the workshop. Um, teaching to transgress. I was given teaching to transgress education as the practice of freedom. Um, I was also given June Jordan, and at the same time there was an intervention where Kwame Doors came over and worked with black writers who were isolated and marginalized from workshop spaces. And it radicalized my life. Um, it radicalized my life because you will see from what I said from the beginning of teaching to transgress how, just from the first page, I could, could understand and totally agree with what was being said and see myself represented like a mirror. So I'm going to read a bit of it. In the weeks before the English department at Oberlin College was about to decide whether or not I would be granted tenure, I was haunted of dreams of running away, of disappearing, yes, even of dying. These dreams are not a response to fear that I would not be granted tenure. They are a response to the reality that I would be granted tenure. I was afraid I'd be trapped in the academy forever. And I'm going to skip to the bit where, um, where she, in apartheid South, black girls from working class backgrounds had three career choices. We could marry, we could work as maids, we could become school teachers. But, and since, according to the sexist thinking of the time, men did not really desire smart women, it was assumed that signs of intelligence sealed one's fate. And she goes on to talk about growing up in, a black, in the segregated black school. And she said, almost all our teachers at Booker T. Washington were black women. They were committed to nurturing intellect so that we could become scholars, thinkers, and cultural workers, black folks who used our minds. We learned early that our devotion to learning, to a life of the mind, was a counter-hegemonic act, a fundamental way to resist every strategy of white racist colonization. Though they did not define or articulate these practices in theoretical terms, my teachers were enacting a revolutionary pedagogy, 
of resistance that was profoundly anti-colonial. Within these segregated schools, black children who were deemed exceptional gifted were given special care. Teachers worked with and for us to ensure that we would fulfill our intellectual destiny and by so doing uplift the race. My teachers were on a mission. And to fill that mission, my teachers made sure they knew us. They knew our parents, our economic status, where we worship, what our homes were like, how we were te treated in the family. And I went to school at a historical moment where I was being taught by the same teachers who taught my mother, her sisters, and brothers. And then she talks about school change utterly with racial integration. Gone was the Mesiatic zeal to transform our minds and beings that had characterized teachers and their pedagogical practices in our all black schools. Knowledge was suddenly about information only. It had no relation to how one lived, behaved. It was no longer connected to anti-racist struggle. Bus to white schools, we soon learned that obedience and not a zealous will to learn was what was expected to us. Too much eagerness to learn could easily be seen as a threat to white authority. When we entered racist, desegregated white schools, we left a world where teachers believed that to educate black children rightly would require a political commitment. Now, we were mainly taught by white teachers whose lessons reinforced racist stereotypes. For black children, education was no longer about the practice of freedom. And realizing this, I lost my love of school. The classroom was no longer a place of pleasure and ecstasy. School was still a political space since we were always having to encounter rice, race, white racist assumptions that we were genetically inferior, never as capable as white peers, even unable to learn. And so I read that to show, I read that to go on to say that it so reflected how I felt and the changes that happened in my own life. And it also reflected what I was experiencing as someone who was writing poetry and starting to try to educate myself. Um, what, this, what this book and June Jordan's book taught me was poetry for the, June Jordan's Poetry for the People, and they were both biblical uh, Bibles to me, um, was the idea of community, was the idea of learning of each one teach one. Some of the slogans that I saw going around Guyana, forward never, backward ever, back, forward ever, backward never, um, but together we aspire, together we achieve. And so based on Bell Hooks, Kwame Doors, Influence, and June Jordan, uh, my friend Roger Robinson and I co-started Malika's Poetry Kitchen. And Malika's Poetry Kitchen was a space where writers could have a space to write, but also to read. And what we encourage people to do is to tell their own stories, but most fundamentally, to read widely. We felt that in order to understand the world and in order to understand poetics, you have to understand that poetics is not British. What's happening in Japanese poetry? What's happening in North American poetry? What's happening in Korean poetry? And each person who finds that poem, who finds those different writers and bring them in, educate us so our education is wider, that being an artist is about craft. Um, it's about, it's about developing your craft, but it's also developing in community. No writer should write alone. It's about giving people permission, and it's about having that space. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and this was a fundamental book with that. Um, I'm finding it really interesting, the idea that when I was at, um, teaching at, um, at higher, in higher education, most of my supervisors' feedback to me would be that the students were really excited, or one of the things that they said is that they'd been exposed to literature, to a vast amount of literature as poets that they had not been allowed, that they'd not yeah. been explored to, explored, ex, ex, exposed to before. Um, and so, in a way, I teach like that. That's part of my life. In, in here, she said, I always wanted to be a writer, and I'm a teacher. I didn't want to be a teacher but I am a teacher. Um, two of the things that are fundamental into my life, I love teaching and I love writing. Um, I love opening and developing new minds. Um, and so one of the things that I hope to do, um, and one of the things this has reminded me to do is to re revisit that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, I'm really interested in this whole debate around decolizing the curriculum, um, but I think 
I think I, 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 I don't aspire to decolonizing the curriculum because the conversations that are happening around that are around getting rid of old white men and putting on a, 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 a multicultural curriculum. But the way Malika Poetry Kitchen um, works is the curriculum is for everybody. We need to have everyone on the curriculum so that we can see what black women writers are doing, what white writers are doing around the same topic. We need to know everything. So I'm hoping that, that I suppose, that I continue to teach the transgress and that I continue to stay in the legacy and, and completely, and revisit this book to remind myself and to, to just reinforce and understand that this is where some of my practices and pedagogy and, and learning has come from. Amazing. Mm. Thank you so much, Malaka. Can we also give a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. And I think it's, it's so interesting that when I ask, I've asked two different individuals a way in which Bell Hooks has inspired or motivated you, and it's, they're so different. And I think that's also testament to the expansiveness. We have classroom and we have pushing through, you know, struggle and strife and pain. And this is what, it, and I'm sure when we go into Sonata, it's going to be a completely different thing. Also, and this is like just the brilliant, you know, expansiveness of this this individual woman, literally one person. Mm -hmm. um, so please, Sonata, please go and go into her influence on your work. Yeah, I know sure. You touched on it earlier, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I will. I just want to just also just acknowledge because yeah. um, I know that you named the loss of her, kind of her physicality, but I, f I very much feel her here. You yes. know, and I think yes. there's something, um, and she writes about this, you yes. know, how we can still be in relationship with our lineage, our ancestry, yeah. you know, and how we can still cultivate and maintain relationship Definitely. beyond that kind of physical communication, you know, in, in the very physical material life um, and what it looks like to have spiritual life and communication yes. beyond. And I think there's something about this that feels very much like mm -hmm. she's here, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and so that's a very special thing. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, so, 10 minutes, you know, to capture, <laughs> <laughs> to capture her, her huge influence on my life. It feels like a big task. Um, and I, I think I want to say, I want to specifically honor all about love. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Though I will speak to some of her other texts, you mm -hmm. know, just because I think how this landed in my life um, and when it landed in my life, was so, so significant for me. And it really, a very painful landing actually, which forced me to confront my own, my own lovelessness, mm -hmm. my own upholding of lovelessness, but also my experiences of lovelessness. And to confront and grieve the fact that I have never, at that point in my life, you know, in my early 20s, experienced love in the way that Belle defined it, which is, which was a very painful yeah, thing, yeah. but also an incredibly transformative thing, yeah. you know. So, yeah, just want to honor this yeah, book. I think for me, I'm going to share like snippets rather than a full text and, and, and talk about it in that way. Um, but from this, but in this book, she talks about, um, she says, pain is not an indicator of dysfunction, yeah. right? And, and that particularly has influenced my work in terms of my therapeutic work, my work as a psychologist, right? Understanding that suffering is an inevitable <coughs> part of the human condition, right? Of course, every single one of us experiences suffering. And that suffering is an understandable response to these systems of domination that we live in, right? And, and Bell names it, you know, she, she coined that term imperialist, imperialist, heteronormative, capitalist, you know, patriarchy. In, in response to those systems of domination, of course we are suffering. But what we have is cultures of lovelessness mm -hmm. that cannot bear prolonged expressions of pain, of suffering, of heartache, of grief, okay? And for me, as, as a therapist especially, I'm, I'm very attuned to how the psychiatric system and our mental health services actually reinforce this idea that actually our pain is a dysfunction. And how does it do this? It uses this language of mental illness, of mental disorder, you know. We've got a whole host of categories that date back to the 1800s that tell us fundamentally that our suffering is a problem within our individual mind, 
okay, rooted in a flawed biochemistry or some kind of unhelpful thinking style. Fundamentally, it says there's something wrong with us as individuals, and it obscures what's happening to us. And so much of Bell's work is helping us understand who we are, how we live in response to these systems of domination, right, and redefining ourselves outside of this. So that, that has been a foundational teaching for me. But also, for me as a therapist, not only understanding that my work is to tend to my own pain and to the pain of others that I'm working with, but to expand this definition of what is the therapeutic, you know, is it actually transforming, the most therapeutic thing would be transforming the conditions in our society that are inducing the suffering, you know. And Bell's work on language, you know, she's so conscious yeah. in her use of yeah. language, and we really see that in this text. And she's heavily influenced by Paolo Freire's teachings, you know. There's a whole chapter on Freire and teaching to transgress, actually. And, um, you know, <coughs> Freire says, the pathway to liberation is naming the worlds that we see. So if we're thinking about this in the context of our pain and how we talk about our pain, right, what would it be like to, instead of maybe saying, I have this thing called depression, that means a wildly different thing if I say that I've got depression or you say that you've got depression, completely different experiences. What would it mean to talk about the ways that our pain shows up? So, you know, I haven't left my house for days. I'm in so much pain, I haven't left my house for days. I cannot bear being in the company of other people. I am cutting my arms, I am hearing voices, right? All of this pain is there, living through the unsurvivable demands of capitalism, right? Enduring this absolutely patriarchal violence that is tearing away my bodily autonomy, you know? And it's making me want to die. What would it be like to use language in a way that we were linking our suffering back to its causes. And that, that for me is you know, a really interesting thing, learning how Bell uses language. And it, it's also, you know, going back to this teaching to transgress, and that, that's a found, such a foundational text for me as well as an educator. Um, education as a practice of freedom. How can we, this is what you're speaking to, how can we invite people to come in their whole selves rather than be impositional with some idea of what knowledge should be, yeah? And, and one question that Bell often asks is, how can we love people where they are when it comes to teaching and in, in our life, you know, more broadly? And I think my work um, in training psychologists where we're doing work around deconstructing systems of whiteness. And part of that we often do, we work in affinity group spaces, so with, with globe majority, you know, black and brown folks, and also white training psychologists. People are at different stages of the work, you know, on this, on, in this practice, emphasis on practice of freedom. Some people aren't practiced, right? So how can we meet people where they are in this journey and believe in their fundamental capacity to, to lean into the practice of loving. And, and then therefore it comes back to love as a choice. We choose to do this work in action, right? This is Bell's core teaching in this, in this book, right? A choice, a will to move towards the spiritual growth of self and of others. And I, um, I wanted to, to you know, just shift to being you know, more, maybe more personal. Um, she, there's a, there's a quote, let me actually get this rather than butcher her, butcher her words, but she says, you know, talks about um, maintaining, how can we maintain commitment rather than sever bonds when it comes yeah. to community, right? And I think um, as a queer person, as a queer person of color, and I think for, for so, many, so many of us, especially those who are, you know, racialized and marginalized, we are told that there are parts of us, that, ourselves, that we should hate or that shouldn't be there, or that we should be in refusal of. And I think what we can do, what we risk doing, um, is internalizing that dominator to become our own inner critic, right? So then when it comes to being in relationship with others, this, this task of maintaining commitment, it's really, really hard because we are faced with a reflection of ourselves other queer folks of color, other people of color, that reflect back the parts of ourselves that we're taught to hate, right? And therefore, we might often lean into replicating cycles of exile. You know, I know, you know, I can speak personally, I've been through that 
experience of, be, of exile for my own family, and then trying to reimagine what a chosen family can, would be like without having really had that modeled or experienced that. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I think coming back to how then can we maintain commitment is the work of love on oneself, building this practice of love and deepening that relationship with oneself actually resources us to be able to enter back into community, to do that work of maintaining bond and maintaining commitment so that we can meet ourselves with compassion. And when we're faced with those, those unsightly reflections based on systems of domination's definition, right, we, we, can, we can meet that with that same degree of love and compassion. And I think what, what to me is key about this is that it doesn't feel good mm, doing exactly, that. Exactly. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the myth exactly. is of romanticism is that it exactly. all feels wonderful. You know, <laughs> it's so pleasurable. Yeah. And, it, and actually, it really mm. is fucking hard. Mm. You know, it's really hard work to do the work of truth telling, mm. to lean into the discomfort of honesty in relationship when it's challenging, when people are upholding harm, mm. to, to invite accountability is a very uncomfortable thing. You know, and also to lean into the space of generativity in conflict is a very, very tricky thing. Mm. It doesn't always feel pleasurable. Mm. And I think that's part of what Bell really teaches us to do is redefine our understanding of the work of love, that it is work. Yeah. You know, we have to really deepen our capacity to do uncomfortable work to show up to be loving in our relationships. Um, and I, um, I, I think there's something that feels really, um, really, really important in this, which is that there is a deep, you know, knocking off the pedestal, the, the intimate relationship here. Mm. You know, it's not just that we only do that work for our partners. Actually, friendship, yes. community, chosen family is essential for our survival. And what she teaches us, you know, in such a profound way is that are we being generous in our resource in all of our relationships in that same way? Are we putting our energy into our friendships in the same way that we pedestal the romantic relationship? So she's really dispelling that, that myth, of, myth of romanticism. Um, I think one last thing, I'm trying to like... No, I know, I know. Shoot I through it. There's so it. many things. There's so many she's things, iconic. you know. <laughs> I think one last thing I wanted to say um, is her core kind of underpinning of her teachings in, in I think, more broadly, what the, what the pathway to liberation is, is underpinned by spirituality. You know, she brings spirituality as the core to her work. And for me, that's been so heart-opening as a Muslim to understand that how can we see spirituality as, as a pathway to liberation? And um, her redefining of love as a verb yeah. and a doing thing as an action helps me reframe my understanding of God. What would it be to actually reimagine God as a doing, a loving doing? And you know, we're in such a painful time at the moment where we've seen the patriarchal violence of theocracy and you know, patriarchal interpretation of religious you know, doctrine being perpetuated in such a violent way. This feels incredibly important. Actually, if we, if we were reframing God as a loving doing in how we are living, what would be possible in terms of freedom? You know? So yeah, that, I think that, that's where I want to leave you and just with deep, deep gratitude for her work, yeah. for how much it has shaped me to be more loving in my life and for me to also not only give love but to deepen my capacity to receive love and have a measure and understanding of what to actually expect rather than this clapped myth, myth of romanticism yeah. that is, yeah, just a big old lie. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you. So, okay, can we give a round of applause? Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Um, exactly. I think that this book is almost like, it's like religious text to me. Um, and I think the way you touched on language, people, the issue with Bell Hooks, she's just done so much. So it's very <laughs> difficult to sort of touch on everything. But her relationship with language, and the specificity that mm. she applies to it. And that her argument is always like, you can change nothing unless you change your language about it. Mm -hmm. And in that book, she discusses the importance of the language we use around love. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of realize, my God, we have been marketed love in the most shambolic and chaotic and toxic way. <laughs> and it's terrible, you know? And mm. 
it is painful, actually, at times reading that book. And depending on where you are in your life, every time you read it, it touches you in a very different way. And it means a different thing. And I think the deconstructing and the unpeeling back of what love is, for me, is Bell Hooks' legacy. But I want to know, I want to ask all of you before we go into questions, what do you think her legacy is to each of you? Because I think she is so expansive and extensive, and there is so much. For me, she does embody love and pushing through suffering. But every time I ask an individual, it's something different. And I think we have seen three very different examples of what she means to three very different individuals. And that's, once again, her brilliance. And I really do urge all of you to go into her text. There's a trove, an absolute trove <laughs> yes, of it. Um, so, Mona, I want to start with you. Um, what is Bell Hooks' legacy to you? Well, you know, my, the, of the books of the trilogy on, on love, right? Yes. All about love and communion. Um, my favorite of the books is the one where she looks at love for older women. Yes. Because that's where I'm at right now, because I keep saying I'm old. Yes. And she looks at love as, you know, in midlife. And I'm 54 years old. And I've been writing a lot about perimenopause and what being perimenopausal is. And my favorite part of being perimenopausal is that I don't give a flying fuck <laughs> about anything anymore. <laughs> Not that I used to before, but even less now, you know? It's like it's a real, it's a real liberation. You know, in between the anxiety and the, the, the gut health issues and what the fuck happened to my sex drive? Yeah, I want to <laughs> fuck anything that moves, you know? Everything between all of that, um, it's a, it, it really is a real liberation. <laughs> And instead of, I, I keep saying, you know, and thank you for laughing because <laughs> I can feel the connection. I feel you. <laughs> I'm editing an anthology called Bloody Hell, Adventures from Menopause, that I want all of you to go and pledge your support to because we're crowdfunding this book. It's called Bloody Hell. Just look Brilliant. it up and pledge Brilliant. your support so I can get this fucking book published. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so perimenopause and, and instead of you know instead of my period and shedding the lining of my uterus every month I shed the lining of patriarchal fuckery and that's what Bell Hooks has been wrote about in the book about you know midlife women and love and she does a real reassessment of you know like, like you said this kind of like this lie yeah. that we were sold exactly. about love yeah. what love means and what what love means mm. for a woman you know middle age midlife call it whatever you want and and, and for me, you know, other than what I, I already said about avenging silence and, and writing in a very confessional kind of, you know, taking risk and being dangerous with my writing and all of that, it's, it's taking um, that, her, her, her big, more expansive view of love now, yes. being polyamorous, being queer, being um, bisexual, um, experiencing the way that my desire and my pleasure has expanded as I get older, and recognizing that because when we're not, you know, older women, we're not allowed to talk about desire and pleasure. And, you know, we don't. And that's because our shelf life for patriarchy is when we cease to become its walking incubators. And I'm not a walking incubator for patriarchy. I'm child free by choice and happily so. And those two abortions I had were in aid of that because I never wanted to reproduce for patriarchy or anyone else. So the way that Bell Hooks talks about love and pleasure and desire and all of that, as an older woman, and I, and I wanted to read to you something else that I included in an essay. I, I also have, so I also want you to all subscribe to my newsletter, Feminist Giant. It's free. If you can pay, it helps to keep it free. But um, as I, I say, I, I never want feminism to be behind the paywall because I'm, I'm, I'm an anarchist feminist and truly fuck the capitalist white supremacist imperialist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Bell Hooks, and I quote her in an essay I wrote for Feminist Giant called um, A Woman in Her 50s and in Love, A Feminist in Her 50s and in Love. And she writes about the pressing issue of whether women could love and write, whether we could be sexual adventurers and use those experiences as imaginative groundwork, and whether we could be the intellectual equals of men, yet garner recognition as significant writers are all revisited here in her work. And she says, throughout this work, I explore the impact a mind-body split had on my consciousness growing up. Clearly, many intellectually gifted women and girls suffer this split. 
Eating disorders are one expression of that suffering. In my girlhood imagination, embodiment was feared as it was linked to exploitation and oppression. Yet later in my young womanhood, I wanted to learn ways to accept and embrace the female body, to discover its pleasure, the desire for sex, the longing to reconcile these desires with a yearning to know love, were all part of my struggle to become a writer, to invent a life, to invent a living life that could nurture and sustain a liberated woman. Fully feminist, fully self-actualized, I wanted to care for the soul and to let my heart speak. And, and she talks about, and this is actually a combination of both that book about being a woman in her midlife and reassessing love, and another book called w Wounds of Passion. Mm -hmm. So the books that she wrote and the ways that she wrote about being a writer that challenges all of those things, those are her legacy for me, especially the older I get and the more that I explore things like desire and pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, we are going to go into questions soon, um, but I do want to hear, Malaika, to her, for you, what, yes, what was her legacy? Um, I think this, I think as a writer, what I'm struck by, um, and as someone who, I remember um, being in my living room with all my, my cousins who, I'm, my mom had her kids, she was the last child, so she had her kids later. Right. So all my other cousins were old, and this room of young women. Right. And they all had a different bell hooks book discussing yes. bell hooks. And yeah. I didn't know bell hooks yet, but I was, I was like, who is this woman? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things as a writer that I'm struck by is the, 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 the absolute resolute um, ambition of bell hooks to be able to communicate, to be able to communicate to everybody yeah. that she was writing exactly. so that it was not going to be behind an intellectual wall. Mm that she was writing so everybody, so that me at 14, at yeah. 16, at 18, can reread her books and get something else, um, and, and, and also can grow and develop. Mm. So I think that, that ability to communicate, yeah. and, that, that, and, and some of that is in my mission statement in my writing, to be able to communicate to my community and the wider community, to the generosity. Mm. I want to and hope to be generous. Mm. Um, as she is with my practice, with my craft, and with enabling other people through what I know, mm. um, and community. Yeah. I think that, the, the, so I, I think for me it's communication, community, and generosity. Yes. And I think that combination, um, and you know, in a world where, and the last thing I would say, and I think. I think um, one of my close friends is here today, but I think in our 50s we came into it. We just yeah. decided, fuck it. Yeah. We're going to dress. I love we're it. We're going to dress <laughs> like, like every day is glamour, yeah. right? We're going to dress like, <laughs> yes. we're going to step out the house like yes. it is because at 50 is where it starts. But I think mm. um, I've always been a black woman who's, who's, who's wanted to, who's been seen, who's who's dressed visibly, mm. who's dressed powerfully. Mm. Um, but what I'm realizing now in this, in this point is that, is that I was dressing in spite of, I was dressing against, I was dressing to combat yes. an idea of beauty of me. Yes. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think the thing that Bell Hooks left for me is that Bell Hooks was undeniably who she was. Yeah. Mm. And what she said to me, what she says to me at this age and at, at the point of who I am is, be undeniable who you are. Mm. If you love wearing bracelets, or if you love mm. wearing rings, and if you love adornment, don't just put on one. 100%. If you could put 10 on each finger, <laughs> on, on 10, 20 on each yes. finger, put them on. Yes. You know, um, and, and be aware yes. of, your, of, your, of, of, of yourself as a beautiful woman, and be aware of yourself as a woman who, when you step in the room, everybody needs to know you've stepped in the room. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Brilliant. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. And I would imagine as well with your teaching, her level of accessibility. Yes, that, that, that communication. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you so much. And last but not least, Sanaa. Yeah, no, I mean, I think just building on that point on yeah. how she showed up in the world, yeah. you know, was in itself um, an embodiment and a modeling of mm. I will be fully me. Mm. And I think. What I loved about Belle, and, and this kind of goes beyond just her writing, yeah. that she really embraced calling herself a hot mess. Yes. She yeah. used to call herself a hot mess, yeah. you know. And I think what she, what she does there 
is actually pedestal complication and contradiction. That all, every single one of us, even if someone who's written all of these texts on what it yeah. means to live a loving life, mm. she can also speak openly about the ways that she's been unloving. And for me, that is foundational as a teacher to, to embody imperfection that every single one of us are imperfect beings in our journeying on this practice of freedom to liberate, towards liberation, that we fall and we mess up and we hurt each other. But how can we, how can we name that with honesty? Yeah. And that's another piece with Belle, is that absolute radical honesty mm. that, you know, I think I can't remember what the example is in, in All About Love where she's like, if I don't like a gift, I'll say it. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, and everyone's yeah. like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, is that yeah. necessary? Is that really? <laughs> is it? Mm. You know, but I think it really stretches us to think about the everyday lies that mm. we tell. Yes. And, and at, for what? You yeah. know, what, how we measure kind of comfort and discomfort. And if we're really truly wanting to embody a liberated way of living, can we constantly meet the edges of our own love mm -hmm. to, to expand and to be more honest, you yeah. know? Um, oh, there's so much to say about her legacy. I think I one other thing that I hasn't been, I just, that I feel no, like hasn't it, been named is just, um, you know, pop culture is pedagogy. Exactly. You yeah. know, that I yeah. feel like she was queen in yeah. bringing this into... A celebrity into blogger <laughs> could never keep... Like, you couldn't touch Bell Hooks. People don't even... <laughs> it's just different how she assesses popular culture. Yeah, just, just you, you know, know, reframing our ideas on what, what is education. Yes. yes. Actually, it's, it's constantly available to us to mm. deepen our learning about what it means to be alive. Mm. And so often, you know, being in the academy and working in... in, in university settings, mm. there's a constant kind of legitimizing of a particular type of knowledge, you yeah. know, which is reinforced with, you know, getting a first in distinction, you study this way, and then you, it, it's a pathway into kind of capitalism in a particular way of living, right? Yeah. But if we're to just absolutely shatter all of that to see yeah. learning as constantly accessible to us in the arts, through conversation, you know, through life as experiment, as messy yeah. experiment, then you know our yeah. our whole idea of education is transformed. Yeah. Um, so there's some. I think there's something about Bell's teachings there that. Are, no, that are really definitely, essential. definitely. And I think specifically for her assessment of popular culture, she got a lot of vitriol for that. Mm. She got a lot, but she never wavered. You know, she yeah. never like she continued. She got a lot of criticism. So people were like, look, you're an academic. Stick to mm. your, your books. Don't involve yourself into. But, she argued it's really important that we understand popular culture because it tells us about our world today, you know, and she, mm -hmm. and she constantly refined. And another brilliant thing about her was that she always would learn, she would backtrack, like, oh, I used to say this, but I know it's wrong, which yeah. sometimes it's hard to do that, but she would publicly do it after being ambassador. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go to questions, but I did want to end on one of my favourite book <laughs> quotes, where... Um, she says that often, I think I touched on it earlier, people say, who the fuck do you think you are about hooks? And she said, I used to ask myself that all the time, who the fuck am I, who the fuck am I? And she said, you know what, I realized I'm bell hooked. <laughs> and the reason I'm bell hooked is because I have suffered mm -hmm. and I made it on the other side. And I think that's so profound. And whenever I'm going through something, it just repeats, repeats, repeats. And so I recommend all of you dive into her stuff. Thank you so much to the three amazing, brilliant speakers. Mm -hmm. We do have a few minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask. Thank you so much. Like genuinely, it's been, um, I feel like I came full uh, as a cup and I've been pouring out whilst you're speaking. Um, and I don't want to go in too deep because I might cry my eyes out. Um, but thank you genuinely. I have a question because vulnerability was mentioned, silence was mentioned. And um, I know sometimes when we see people, especially speakers or artists, we think you've got it all or that um, you're able to be there present um, without feeling vulnerable. Um, but we're all multifaceted and we're all vulnerable. And I guess my question is, um, what is the loudest silence around love that you currently sit with? And I'd love that to be answered by all four of you. <laughs> you know, my father just passed away in December. And um, one of the things I'm reconciling with is that um, my relationship with him has made me have a position about my relationship with men. And, um, and there's something that I'm trying to work out about love and lack of love and vulnerability um, and power. There's a dynamic that I have of being a Caribbean woman that, and I don't know what it is. I'm in a space of, I'm in my house a lot. I'm not talking to a lot of my friends. I'm thinking through a lot of things at the moment. I'm in a moment of, 
um, of reflection. But I'm thinking through, I, 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 when I was there in, in, in Guyana for the funeral, I, I found myself saying things like, that's why I don't go to live in a man's house if they're gonna live anywhere, they're gonna live in mine, so I can kick them out if they do something wrong. Um, so I'm exploring, and I, I'm really exploring it, um, because I could hear some of the things that I was saying, especially when I was with a lot of my male family members. And, um, and I feel that it, evolve from my father, my grandfather, and people like that. So it's something that I'm exploring um, and, and wondering if I contributed to my single, my being single for so, so much of my life. Um, so it's a question I'm, I'm wondering and I'm, and I'm wondering and about love and vulnerability. Mm. Amazing, thank you. I'm sorry for your loss. That's, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for sharing. Um, so you said it's the loudest silence around love. Um, yeah, I guess to sort of chime in, I think mine is also similarly around death. And I think for some reason, most of my silences around love tend to be around death. So this year, um, so my family, I'm going to start crying. I'm not going to cry. But I am from a place called Chugrai in Ethiopia. So we've had a lot of family who have died because there's been a raging war there. The manner in which many of them died were in the most undignified ways. Um, and so as soon as I broke out, actually I read this book five times to sort of <laughs> get myself through it. But I think most of the silence or perhaps avoidance around having to deal with certain things pertaining to that is very linked to death and love and sort of what happens when people die in very undignified ways who maybe had no idea it was coming. And I think if you are from regions that are war-torn, or pertaining to genocide, or extreme suffering, or protest and revolution, that is a common theme that you battle with. Um, and so you do sit in a lot of silence um, because of the difficulties around that. So I would say that is, and that's probably going forward, going to be, and it's almost, this also means I'm going to read a lot of this again mm. and again and again. Mm. Um, but yeah, I would say, and she beautifully also explores sort of, you know, the, the double-edged sword of love and death and loss. I, it, what a, like it's a question that really yeah, um, it's a brilliant question. invited a deeper thinking for me. So I just want to thank you for such a beautiful question. Um, and I think my relationship to silence has been quite a complicated thing. Silence has actually um, indicated a lot of threat and loss. So, you know, from experiencing kind of exile or, you know, severance from my family, Silence felt like a very painful place to bear and to stay in, you know. Um, and I think also in that silence, um, discerning kind of absolute loneliness from being able to bear my, my own company and eventually get to a place of loving my own company and, and moving into solitude and mm -hmm. having a different relationship with silence, um, I think has been really foundational for me actually is being conscious in choosing a practice of silence where I am actually there to deepen my relationship with myself, to cultivate love for myself so that in those, in those huge gulfs of, of absence without family, you know, where people will fall short and won't be able to love you in the ways that you long for them to, can I draw on myself, you know? And when I say that, not always, isn't it? It's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, but that is what I'm trying to do, cultivate a new relationship with silence that is more loving. I think I've said everything there is to say. <laughs> I don't know what is left. I've told you I'm, I'm queer, I'm polyamorous, I've had two abortions. What is, what is there left? So, but you've really challenged me, you know, because like I said, courage is a muscle, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to, to exercise it with bigger weights. And one of the things that is if I were to pull away at the core and get to the place that perhaps hurts the most, that needs to be talked about more, is what sometimes is called as the mother wound, and I would take it back to the grandmother wound, mm. because my maternal grandmother was pregnant 14 times, and 11 of those pregnancies came to term. And the eldest of those children is my mother, so she's the eldest daughter. 
And my mother has three children and I'm the eldest of those children and I'm child-free by choice. And sometimes I think that, sometimes, so I say I'm child-free by choice and happily so, and sometimes I wonder how much by choice because there's a part of me that knows that I'm avenging, I feel I'm avenging my grandmother because I don't think my grandmother had much choice. I can't imagine anyone choosing to want to be pregnant 14 times. My grandmother was quite depressed and I know that she had electric shock therapy at some, time, at some point, because they were still doing that at the time. And I feel a deep, deep sadness for her. And I don't know if it's, it's well-placed or not. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm projecting onto her or not. She's not here anymore. But I feel a deep sadness for her. And I'm, so there's a part of me that feels that I'm avenging her silence, but I also feels incredibly arrogant to think that I'm using whatever privileges I have now, you know, the intricacies of her life I, I don't know about. I'm glad I experienced her. I was, I was there while she was still alive, but I just feel a great, I feel that she has passed on to me. If I say Mona died in 2011 and bequeathed me her silences, I feel my maternal grandmother bequeathed me her sadness. Mm. So I think that is a silence around love that I'm trying to grapple with because I love her and I know that she loved me and I know that she loved my mother and I, I'm, I imagine now, filling in the gaps now, that they had a very difficult love because she had 14 children, my mother has three, my mother has a PhD in medicine that she got here in the UK after she got a scholarship to come here and I imagine the massive gap that that created between her and her mother and now the massive gap between me and my mother. Mm -hmm. Because here I am sitting, my, I don't know what my mum would do if she were here, and I'm sitting there telling you I'm polyamorous and mm. I'm bisexual and I had two abortions. My, I don't know what my mum would do. She's already like, you, all you do is talk about sex. <laughs> you know, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this massive gap between my mum and her mum and this massive gap between me and my mum and the silences that fill in those gaps and the love that I'm trying to insert into those silences instead. So thank you for a really challenging question. Mm. Brilliant it's question. really good. Thank you. Brilliant mm. question. Thank you. Mm. So I think we have, to, we have to wrap up, I believe. So yes, I do apologize. But this is, this is what Bell Hooks does. <laughs> you see, you just, we probably, you know, us four can get together. Maybe we'll create a Bell Hooks literary festival and we can just have <laughs> loads of events just talking about her. We should. And have you moderated? Thank you for your moderation. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. Beautiful. So much. It really was. The book, shout out your book again. You told them, you told us to you were crowdfunding for a book. Oh, oh say the bloody name. hell, Adventures in Menopause. Fund my book so I can get it published. Yes, thank you, Magdalena, you go, thank you. you. <laughs> um, so no, thank you all so much. Thank you individually, amazing. Thank your you. Your on Bell Hooks was amazing. Thank you all. Thank you for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you.